Welcome to The Romantic Side of Suspense with Sarah Hemmerker. In each episode, she'll talk with your favorite romantic suspense authors. They will take you behind the scenes of the writing process, giving excerpts from their writing, and share stories about their writing life. Discovering Rafe by Sarah Blackard Now that she has his attention, will her happily ever after be ripped away? Piper Fields finds contentment in managing her cousin's music career from the safety and anonymity of staying behind the scenes. Since her parents' death at barely 13, Piper's fear of losing others has kept her focused on caring for those she loves. Meanwhile, her own dreams have been left backstage. Not that it really mattered anyway. Her dreams were out of reach, and so was her brother's friend, Rafe Malone. Rafe Malone approached life with a firm desire to safeguard those who couldn't protect themselves and have fun in the process. That all changed the day a mission for the army turned south, forcing him to take the life of a child soldier. Now the jokester mask he wears to hide his pain is put to the test when his best friend's sister needs his help. No matter how hard he tries to convince himself he shouldn't taint her with his tarnished soul, her nurturing presence tempts him to break the bro code of staying away from your friend's sister. Can Rafe keep Piper safe when the evasive threat turns deadly? Will Piper trust what she's discovered in Rafe, or is it just another childish daydream? Hi, and welcome to this episode of The Romantic Side of Suspense. I'm Sarah Hamerker, and I'm glad you joined me. Today I'm talking with another Sarah, Sarah Blackard. She's a Christian romance novelist who writes stories that thrill the imagination and strum the heartstrings. And I am excited that we're going to be talking about writing, romantic suspense, and who knows what else. So welcome to my show, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. Now, we were talking before we before um, <clears throat> I started recording about um, having to lock ourselves away from our families so we can record <laughs> in the quiet. <laughs> the quiet. That sounds funny, doesn't it? <laughs> no, it does. <laughs> yeah. Um, I always say I'm um, hiding. I'm hiding from my kids. <laughs> yeah. Um, and when my kids were littler, um, and I, as a freelance journalist, I did a lot of, I still do a lot of interviews, but I would have to um, you know, remind them, hey, I'm on the phone, <laughs> please don't burst into the office, or if you're in the office with me, which when they were little and they couldn't be on their own, that was it. And I remember always telling you know, people I was interviewing, I said, hey, you know, if you hear a squeal, I just, my kids are just playing here while I'm on the, you know, doing this. Um, it used to be kind of an anomaly, and now it's like ev- that's everyone's world. I'm like, welcome to my world, right? <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> with everyone home and listening to all of that. Um, and so, and now, and it also helped me as I was training them to play by themselves and stuff so that I would have time to write. Now, um, you know, you have five kids and you mm-hmm. homeschool. So how do you fit writing into your life? Yeah, um, it was, it was kind of difficult finding a balance at first, actually. Um, but I, I primarily, I get up early, um, <clears throat> and it's hopefully before anybody else gets up. Not always, um, but I try and get up some somewhere between five and five thirty, and then um, try and get as much writing as I can before everybody starts getting up. And then, however much doesn't get done, I just have to do in between helping with math and reading and um, all the stuff that goes on with a big family of five up here in Alaska. Um, and so we, you know, I, I've gotten really, really good at, at being able to write in snippets. So, you know, I can write five minutes and get, get a good couple paragraphs done and then, you know, get interrupted and then go right back into it. Um, it took a lot of practice, but it's, I, I'm, fairly good at it now and most days I can I can hit my word count (laughs) yeah I think that one of the things that um I did talked a lot to a lot of moms groups especially when my kids were younger um about time management and Mm -hmm. that was the one thing I used to say um I said look I said you know you have time 
we all have time. Yep. It's what we choose to fill our time with. And it's also what we tell ourselves in our minds, right? It's, mm-hmm. you know, when you have five minutes, what you're saying to yourself is, I have five minutes, I'm going to write. Mm-hmm. You know, most days. We, yeah. all, we all know we have those days where we just can't motivate ourselves worth anything. <laughs> you know, because we're human. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, right, and I used to do the same thing. You know, I would have, you know, ten minutes. Well, I had an article that's due. I couldn't wait for inspiration to hit me. I got to get those words out. Um, so, yeah, learning to write in those little snippets of time. And then as your time, as your kids get older or they, you know, things get a little easier or they're able to do more things, then you can expand the time you have. But, you know, right. it's funny, it was the first time I realized, oh, I have two, I have an, what, I have an hour to write something? I, I didn't know what to do with myself. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I hadn't well, had that before. Times, <laughs> yeah, and a lot of times I'll do, you know, I'll, I'll get a good chunk of writing in the morning before anybody else gets up. And then I know, okay, I might not have the best focus right now, so I'm going to work on things like advertising or, um, you know, newsletters, that kind of stuff when I'm getting interrupted and then know that maybe in the afternoon I might have a bigger chunk of time. So right. it's just, yeah, yeah, totally that balancing. What can I do during this time? That's not just wasting it. So, yeah. Yeah. And I like, uh, I've been becoming more and more of a fan of batching. So trying to, you know, do those non-creative tasks um, at the same time, so I'm mm-hmm. not constantly being pulled out of when I have creative time. I'm not being pulled to do things like check email or, you know, whatever else it may be that's, um, you know, or do, you know, check my face, you know, go around and answer reader comments on Facebook or whatever when I don't want to be pulled out of my writing. It's that balance. Right. But it can be hard because sometimes you just don't feel motivated. <laughs> To yeah, write, or maybe that's just me. Occasionally, I'm like, I don't really want to write. Um, oh no, yeah, I get that too. And then sometimes it's just like, okay, I just have to do it. <laughs> if I'm going to yeah. hit my goals, I just have to do it. So, and so, how do you how do you get past that to get the words kind of flowing a little easier? Um. Well, you know, honestly, I just <clears throat> I I just start writing, um, and. Sometimes it's it's agonizing and it seems like just a sentence takes 10 minutes to write, but at least I got the sentence down. Um, and, and other times it's just a matter of um, rereading what I wrote and then that will, you know, push, push the inspiration forward. Um, and sometimes it's just walking outside, you know, <laughs> or yeah. doing, doing something that, that is – different um talking through the scene i don't know there's there's a lot of different ways um but i also i i i'm a plotter so um you know a lot of times there's not i i kind of know where my story's going um and so it's 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 pretty rare that I have nothing you know if, if i'm having a really hard time on the scene i'll just jump to another one and then Sometimes that scene that I was having a really hard time on doesn't need to be in the book. So, or, or that the way that it should be written, you know, uh, materializes in my head or whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As I wrote it. <clears throat> but having all having the scenes kind of roughly plotted helps me with that too. So. Yeah, and sometimes I find when I'm, I'll go clean something or. <laughs> Mm-hmm. wash the dishes, which I don't do that much anymore because, you know, I have kids <laughs> who are perfectly capable of doing chores. So right. a lot of times occasionally I'm like, okay, I need to deep clean the bathroom because they do a good job, but they don't do a mom good job. <laughs> so yeah. every once in a while I need to scour the kitchen, uh, not because, you know, they're not doing it, but because they just don't get quite in all the nooks and crannies. So, Oh, um, yeah. That can be helpful to work out a plot problem or wherever I'm feeling stuck about it. Or sometimes I'll daydream about the next book. Yeah, <laughs> which can too. be 
<laughs> yeah, a little dangerous because, you know, that, that those, that's that shiny new object that doesn't have any blood, sweat, and tears in, and so it looks really good as opposed to the the one in front of me, which is giving me fits. So kind of the yeah. grass is greener. <laughs> yeah. And then you start thinking of all the things that you could do with that one. <laughs> yeah, I know. But it's not not yeah. good. <laughs> not a good. So, um, so where does your plot inspirations come from? How do you decide what um, to write about? Well, they've kind of flown, um, flown. <laughs> they've come <laughs> from uh, my first series, my Vestige in Time series. It was really something that God just laid on my heart. Of um, I was back home to Colorado, and I, I just got an inspiration for the people that were thrown back into time and um and i wanted it it was set there in colorado and what would it be like to be you know in the middle of the rockies um during a time that you didn't understand and um and so god really like those those books just kind of laid out in my brain and um i had them pretty much all written in my head before i even started putting down words to the paper um and and then from there my next series the striker security force series it kind of grew out of that series it was you know the same men that were um in the army with the um main character from the first book and in my time travel series and and it was kind of like what happened after he vanished um and what propelled them all on this journey that they're on right now and so um the series that i'm working on now it's is all about the rest of that team um and it's kind of like the they had a mission go go wrong and it's the um after effects of that um Mm. and now that they're out of the army you know what they're doing and um it's it's really just uh, i don't know god's pretty amazing in how he gives us ideas um and how how those grow and so I, I don't I don't know plots well not plots per se but ideas come pretty rapidly to me and <laughs> I don't yeah. have like um I don't know at least five or six other series already already kind of plotting in my head for future things um but but these first two really just grew out of that um, first series, and, and I, I can only say it's from God, <laughs> honestly. Yeah. So, there's no so way. So, what I is your? Yeah, I know. I mean, plots are plots can be tricky. You know, I mean, I have a million ideas, and it's just a matter of you know thinking through them a little bit to see if this, is, if this is a book idea, a short story idea, a novella idea, or just an idea that's not none of this, because <laughs> mm-hmm. I have those two. Yeah. I'm like, that's good, but I can't develop it more than like three paragraphs here. <laughs> just, right. just not going to go anywhere. Um, but that can be, it can be fun. I mean, the stories in our head, obviously, is, 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 you know, they need an outlet. I'm so glad that, you know, people like to read books <laughs> so that we can yeah, get the stuff too. out of our head, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's nice to finally be in the process of writing um, and it's so that they're not all just bottled up in there. <laughs> that gets a little chaotic when, when I didn't have the outlet, so... Yes, 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 definitely, definitely. Mm-hmm. And outlining a book or writing down the idea, kind of, okay, all right, I have it down. Now I'll get to it. Let me right, <laughs> yep. Get it out of my head. Uh, yeah, one book at a time. <laughs> yeah. I know, I can't, I can't write more than one at a time because I'll get all mixed up. Uh, um, yeah, although my brain keeps going, yes, but what about, I'm like, be quiet. I will get to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So what does your family think about you writing romantic suspense? Um, they are really, really excited. Um, you know, I, I started, I was going to wait it, until um, the kids got out of the house and I was done homeschooling or at least got them to a point, you know, because I still have young kids. My youngest is three, 
where, you know, they were doing most of it on their own and stuff. But I went to a homeschool convention and went to a workshop. Uh, It was a math workshop of all things. And the guy was like, we're going to set some goals. And he challenged, you know, all the moms there because it was pretty much just a room full of moms and said, I want you to write down a goal that has nothing to do with your kids, your husband, or your home. And ah. I, was, I, I could not think of anything because as a homeschool mom, you know, uh, yeah. on the spot, it's like my life is wrapped up in my kids and my home, you know. Well, he was brilliant, and wasn't he? He really, really was. Um, and so, you know, at the time I was really struggling with some um, health issues. And so, you know, I wrote that down as my goal. But that that challenge really, like, haunted me for, for several months and um, – made me really look at what, what did I want as, you know, something for myself. Um, And the answer that just kept coming up was writing because I had this whole series of novels in my head. Um, But I kept saying, oh, I'll have to do that later. And um, so I took that challenge and I said, okay, I'm going to do this. Uh, I had my first book like half written and um, I, I buckled down and finished it. And at the same time, I had a friend here um, in Tok who was like, I heard you're a writer. I'm a writer, too. Can we do, like, set up this writer's group? And I was like, okay. (laughs) We left the two of us there for a while, and we've added another writer into it. Um, But I just was like, you know, I am going to do this. And I finished the book and started writing the next one, started looking into publishing. And my kids were like, you know, what are you doing? And and I was like, I'm doing this because I want you to see. I keep telling you, you know, I, I always tell my kids, you can do whatever you want. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, you know, um, it doesn't matter how good your grades are. It doesn't matter if you, you know, grasp the concept. As long as you apply yourself, you can, it might take longer, it might take hard work, but you can do whatever you want. But then I wasn't doing what I wanted, <laughs> you know. Right. I wasn't reaching for my dream and so I was like I can't be that a hypocrite who won't Mm. do what my dream is and so um I just started reaching for it and they are so excited my my um my second oldest he's 11 he'll come and be like so how's your sales going today mom (laughs) and uh, my six-year-old will come up, how's your book going today? Is it, is it writing okay? And um, my oldest, he's four, uh, 14, he'll be 15 in March. Um, he is doing a um, write a novel in a year curriculum. And mm. um, I think that's what it's called. But he he's like really excited. He has this whole series planned out. And we're working through, you know, him writing it, and we're talking about ways that he can publish it and things because it's like a fantasy type book, and how we can, you know, he's talking about ways that he can um, create other avenues of marketing and like all these different things. And so it's really become. Um, and now my my daughter, she's eight. She wants to write picture books, and so it's really become kind of like this family thing where they're all cheering me on and and um, wanting to see how things are going. And, and um, so when I, when I say things like, okay, I need to, I need to close myself in my room and, and have five minutes to finish this scene, you know, they really try to help and help with the three-year-old. And um, they've been just amazing. Like I couldn't, I, I can't imagine having better kids and a better husband. And it's been great. Yeah, that's, that's, um, it's always fun when we can, show our kids, especially as moms, <clears throat> that, yeah, I'm a mom. I'm also a writer, you know, mm-hmm. that you have an outside interest. I, I think that's so important no matter what your interest is, that um, it can be a hobby, it can be for your own enjoyment, or it can be something that you want to, you know, make some money on. Um, you know, that's just the fact that we do all have talents and abilities and um, you know, that we need to use those. We need to not just mm-hmm. let them atrophy and, <laughs> and let our kids not see us as, as you know, separate. For the way that kids need to see us separate from being a mom. Um, 
because we were a different person before we got married and before we had kids. We were, we're still that person. We're just, we just added these other layers onto it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I also incentiv- incentivized it too. So, you know, uh, I went self-publishing, a self-publishing route because my husband and I are entrepreneurs. Um, and so that just kind of fit with who we are. And, you know, I told them we living in Alaska with five kids, it's expensive to travel places. So we don't go that often. And I was like, okay, kids, you know, the, the reason why, well, not the only reason, but we need, once we start making money with this, you know, this is going to be our travel fund. So it's, it's a little <laughs> Yeah. So they're going to say, yeah, mom, I'll take care of the, I'll take care of uh, the little, the little one when you write. I love that, yeah. Sarah. That's great. That is great. Uh, well, we are out of time, but, but thank you so much for being on my show. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. You have been listening to The Romantic Side of Suspense. I'm your host, Sarah Hammerker, and I've been talking with Sarah Blackert, uh, another Christian romantic suspense author. And you can find out how to get in touch with her with the notes for this podcast. Stay tuned for an excerpt from her latest book, Discovering Rafe. Now an excerpt from Discovering Rafe by Sarah Blackard. Piper clung to the door as the vehicle swerved on a patch of slick road. The snow fell so thick, she didn't know how Rafe could drive. Between the horrible road conditions and his words about her making it hard to think, her stomach had been in knots the last four hours of the drive. The wind hit the side of the car and she slammed her eyes closed. She didn't want them open when the car careened off the edge of the road. Are you sure we shouldn't stop somewhere and wait this out? Piper squeaked as the wind pushed them again. Once we get through the canyon, we'll be in Glenwood. Rafe's jaw clenched in the dim light from the dash. I'd rather keep going until they get you safely home to the ranch. She'd tried to keep the conversation flowing for the last four hours, hoping to keep herself from worrying over the weather and Chloe, but also to keep the exchange from straying into the uncomfortable again. Why she had ever thought it'd be a good idea to bring up her high school torture was beyond her. She would have preferred him never knowing that little bit of humiliating history. Of course, then he never would have called her a knockout. She peeked at him again, wondering if he'd spoken the truth. The SUV swerved, and she blurted the first question that popped in her head to distract herself. So, you live at a ranch with a bunch of guys. What, like a special ops frat house or something? We call it the mansion. It's dreamy. You'll like it. He winked at her before turning his attention back to the road. She rolled her eyes at his emphasis on man. We call it or you call it? That sounds like something stupid you'd come up with. Hey, I resent that. I come up with great names. All the guys love it. Rafe's hidden smile ruined his hurt expression. Like your names for our fork growing up? Those weren't that great. I don't remember. Rafe's forehead scrunched as he leaned closer to the steering wheel. Two dudes and two duds place. Piper crossed her arms and leaned against the door, suddenly glad the trip had taken twice as long. It gave her the perfect opportunity to stare. Rafe's head tipped back and his full laugh filled the space. The sound swirled like hot cocoa down her throat and pooled in her belly. Gosh, she loved his laugh. Her smile wavered. She would never recover from this time with him. She'd spent half her life pining over Rafe the boy. Age and life's trials had just made the boy into an even more incredible man that checked all her boxes and crossed all her T's in the love of your life list. Great. Old Matery, here I come. (laughs) Oh, man, that was a great name. 
He wiped a tear from his eye. No, it wasn't. What did we end up naming it again? Probably something lame. Piper cleared her throat. The shack. Rafe started laughing again. <laughs> That's better. He hit the steering wheel with his hand. Oh, we did have some transcendent moments out in that rickety thing, though I'm not sure if they'd be considered heavenly inspired. How were we to know that book and movie would come out? Piper turned forward. And speak for yourself. That fort was my sanctuary. I spent hours talking to God out there. The next few seconds felt pregnant, like the air grew thick and would pop. What kind of things did you talk about? Rafe's low question had no laughter in it. She shrugged, sorry she'd brought that up. Would everything she said lead her right into trouble? Stuff, boy stuff. She pitched her voice like an elementary school kid taunting when she said boy, then twisted her hands in her sweater. Silly stuff mostly, at first anyway, then more serious as I got older. She sighed and leaned her head against the icy door window. I spent hours there praying for you and Davis, then hours praying for Chloe when she started to get so sick. Yeah, so maybe the name fit after all. She closed her eyes and willed down the burn of worry that lapped at her heart. It had become her constant companion over the years, but she resented its presence. She didn't want to be that person, the one always fretting over everything. It seemed since her parents' deaths, she couldn't avoid it no matter how much she ignored it. She tried so hard to hide her fretfulness, which made the heartburn worse. Rafe's warm hand stilled hers, twisting in her lap. Her eyes popped open, and she peered at him. He gave her a soft smile and squeezed her hands. Thank you for your prayers, Piper. You don't know how much that means to me. He swallowed and turned his gaze back out the windshield. She waited for him to pull his hand away, but he didn't. Instead, he pushed his hand between hers and threaded her fingers with his. Her chest expanded with so many emotions she couldn't catalog them properly. Joy, love, pain, and yes, worry, all fluttered spastically against her heart. His thumb started making slow circles on the back of her hand. She stared out the windshield, blinking to keep her tears firmly in her eye sockets. Please stay put. She didn't want to embarrass herself any more than she already had. Something bounced in the splotch of light from the headlights. What the? Rafe's hand tightened in hers. Another object pinged even closer. What is that? Piper leaned forward to get a better look. No sooner had the words escaped her mouth than a large rock the size of a football landed on the hood and rolled off the other side. Rafe jerked his hand out of hers as a crash hit the roof. Rock slide! His words tumbled fear into her throat. He pushed on the gas and rocketed down the interstate, slipping this way and that. The pinging of rocks on metal barraged her ears. The road disappeared to rocks, dirt, and snow. They weren't going to make it. Thanks for listening to The Romantic Side of Suspense with Sarah Hammerker. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review. You can sign up to receive notifications of upcoming podcasts and listen to previous editions at sarahhammakerfiction.com.